Ich freue mich, dass ich Ihnen nun Jochen Appelo ankündigen darf, der, so denke ich, den Versuch machen wird, uns zu zeigen, was man aus der agilen Entwicklung von Softwaresystemen übertragen kann, übertragen sollte auf neue Techniken von Management. Bitte begrüßen Sie mit mir Jochen Appelo. Dank. Is my microphone working? Yep, I hear myself. All right, good. Um, I'm not from Germany, I'm Dutch. I'm sorry about that, right? I apologize for that. It is, I, th I always feel it's very safe to start with apologizing that I'm from Holland. You know, all those, those cars on the German highways on the left side that drive too slow with the mobile homes behind them? That was not me, right? But I apologize for my fellow countrymen. All right, let's get, uh, let's get started. So yes, uh, this, this talk is about agile management, at least things that I have learned in, in the software world where we call the new ways of doing software agile. And I believe we can, we can transfer those ideas to management in, in general. Uh, I'm the writer of these two books, Management 3.0 and, and How to Change the World. I had to learn how to be a manager in, in software organizations for about 15 years. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you heard of the brand Heineken sometime in your life. That was one of our customers, very demanding customer, I can tell you. Um, and we introduced Agile in our organization. Everyone was happy with it. And me too as a manager, but I had to find out what is my role, because we have self-organizing teams. They make their own decisions. So I said that thinking, okay, what do I do now? Uh, so I wrote that book uh, uh, about that, that issue. And, and change management seems to be a big topic nowadays, so I, I wrote a little book about that. Now my, uh, <clears throat> my talk for today starts with this question. Why, why is this military squad doing push-ups? Does, uh, does anyone know? Why are they doing push-ups? Suggestion? Waste time. To waste time. Oh, that could be a reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any others? Discipline. discipline. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, discipline. And any discipline, wasting time? Any other suggestions? Get people laying on the ground. I'm sorry? Get people laying on the ground. Like, get them to lay on the ground, yes. Or make a dent in the world, as they are doing here, right? Yeah. Yes. So, various reasons. I would, I'd say one of them is to, is to become healthy in order to deal with an uncertain environment because healthy bodies and healthy minds are more able to survive, I would, I would say. And uh, there's a management guru, Patrick Lencioni, who just wrote a book uh, about why organization health trumps everything. And he said, uh, organization is health, an organization is healthy when it's whole and consistent and complete. So I believe we have to strive for healthy organizations, but, but how do you do that? S suppose this is one of, your, one of your employees. This is Melly. Melly is, Melly is smiling, friendly when you're walking by and looking over her shoulder and you think, oh, Melly is, a, Melly is a good worker. She's always here on time and doing her best and uh, she seems to be uh, enjoying her job. Well, not really, because inside she's screaming. Inside, actually, Melly Jean hates her job. That's, this, is, this is a picture from my hometown, Rotterdam, uh, where I'm from. This picture has been hanging there for 20 years on the building, a big photograph. Melly Shum hates her job. And I've been wondering for 20 years, why is she hating her job? <laughs> and apparently this is a work of art uh, that somebody put up, put up there. <clears throat> and she's not the only one, I'm afraid. Actually, there's, there's research out there uh, quoted in Fast Company. Uh, they say over half of American workers effectively hate their jobs. That's a sad thing, isn't it? And in a book, uh, latest book by Gary Hamill, the number one management guru, I, I read uh, similar research, but he quoted global figures. He said the same applies to, to everyone in the world. About, about half of the people in the world hate Americans. Uh, sorry, hate, hate their jobs, right? hate their jobs. <laughs> Another mistake. Many people hate their jobs. So uh, that's a problem. That's a big issue. And I believe people have been hating their jobs for 100,000 years or more. Uh, it started in, 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 uh, uh, in 100,000 BC, more or less. This is, this is 
a model. I find it a useful model, the spiral dynamics model. It helps me to tell my story. It looks a bit like a tornado that went to a carnival here in Bonn. And uh, it, has, uh, it has different levels, eight levels. And the first level says your job was to survive for yet another day. Chase after mammoths. Run away from lions. That doesn't sound like a very fun job, actually. And then uh, afterwards, the, the second level, they said uh, that the, the, jo the job was to do what the tribes demanded of you, because tribes were being formed. And it also doesn't sound like, very, like a, lot of, a lot of fun to me. And then the tribes went to war, and they started stealing each other's, uh, other's possessions and wives and things like that. The terrible times. Do whatever you want. Also not, not very fun, particularly not for the others, I can, I can imagine. And then the blue level is uh, when, when central authority be is for, was being formed and people were slaves for, uh, uh, of central authority and they demanded what you had to do. Bad times, I can tell you. Now some people still suffer from that. They still suffer from central authority and maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you, this is, this is you, imagine this is you. It's actually my cousin Eric, he has a funny face but I like, I like uh, using his picture. So this is you trying to come up with better ways of, of, of organizing. Maybe, we, maybe we'll be happier if we perform better. Some people say, we can help with that. We can help you perform better. And they see the organization as a machine, a machine consisting of parts. And uh, this is the underlying philosophy of scientific management and, and some flavors of project management. And yes, structured programming in my world in the 80s, very construction oriented. And uh, the basic idea was you all play a part in the whole construction. Your goal is to increase performance, uh, do better. You do your part better and Melly does her part better. And then uh, everyone is assigned their own goals. Don't disturb the others. Well, it turns out it doesn't work that well. Because according to uh, research and lots of, uh, lots of articles, uh, this one by Fortune magazine, it says 70% of all strategies and projects fail. And I'm quite sure this hasn't changed much. This is from 1999. Not good, not good. So we're still not happy and still not achieving great results. Maybe we should work toward a greater purpose, a greater purpose for the organization. Well, some people say we can help with that. We have some good ideas and they see the organization as a sport, as a team sport, let's work together. You're not trying to win by yourself, we're trying to win together. Beat the competition, kick their ass. That is basically the philosophy that, that these people have. And I would say this is what Six Sigma has attempted and total quality management, theory of constraints, business process re-engineering, all the jobs were rewired and everyone was being taught you're, 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 you're trying to achieve something bigger than just uh, your own uh, great performance. So uh, we all have to change for the greater good. This is, this is the sixth level, the green level according to Spiral Dynamics. Your job is to sacrifice yourself in order to achieve group harmony. I'm afraid things were not, still not working very well. Because uh, these, these tend to be fads that come and go and come and go all the time. We have them every year. And the fads fail to deliver on their promises, said an article in Harvard Business Review. So uh, we're, not, we're not getting any better. But uh, now we get to the highest levels of the, of the model. Now the, the, the end is in sight, I believe. Uh, so this is you and you think, this is interesting, but how do we increase our health and, and become happier? Well, some people say we can help with that. And they have, they have this metaphor of a community. The organization is not a machine, it's not a sport, it is a community of people doing things for themselves, but also contributing to, uh, to the whole. <clears throat> it is actually a bit more complex than what we previously assumed. And this is the underlying philosophy of agile thinking in the software world, lean thinking in manufacturing, some specific methods such as Scrum and Kanban have become very popular. And uh, the basic idea is, well, do whatever you want, but you have to contribute somehow to this organization that you're part of. Uh, so try to, try to express yourself, but avoid harm and help others. Find your own best place in the organization. We call that uh, level yellow. It's the seventh one. And it actually works. There's research out there that confirms that agile, at least within the scope of software development, it works. People who are, 
who have, uh, who have transformed to agile organizations, they report in big numbers that they're better able to manage change, for example, managing changing priorities, uh, better project visibility, and also very interesting, increased productivity and faster time to market. That's what all managers want, don't they? Fa faster, faster time to market and, and higher productivity. Also number four, team morale is going up. Happier people. We actually see that, uh, see that happening. So good things, good things are being achieved. Interestingly enough, different community leaders have different suggestions on how to do that precisely. I'll give you some, uh, some, uh, some actual examples. Scrum is by far the most popular software method but th that we have right now in the software world. It is big. If you're not doing Scrum, you're behind the times. That is sort of the, the assumption nowadays. So many organizations are struggling to, to implement Scrum. And the basic idea is very simple. Reduce the size of your project to a sprint of one or two weeks. Very short. Anticipate only the next few weeks. The rest we'll see when we get there. Sort of. So we, you do that sprint, you plan one sprint ahead and then you cycle, you iterate in short cycles. This goes on all, <clears throat> all the time. And these small boxes of work are then processed through the, through the team. Uh, as they say in systems theory, every big working system started out as a small working system. You cannot create a big working system from scratch. It has to start as a small one that works. This is basically what Scrum does. There's a competitor now. <clears throat> There's a competitor in our, uh, in our world in software. They call it Kanban, after the Kanban cards in lean manufacturing that they use in at Toyota, for example. They say we're not even going to schedule sprints anymore. Let's forget about that whole time boxing. We're just going to have stuff move across our Kanban board in a continuous flow. But we can only add a piece of work when another has finished. You are not allowed to give a team more work, you have to keep it to yourself, unless the team says, we're done with this. Then they allow you to give you a new Kanban card, basically. It works like crazy, according to, to the people who have implemented. You can go even faster. Then there are other uh, uh, people who come from a very different world, but seem to have thinking that is very much in line with, with, with us uh, in, in the agile world. Beyond budgeting, for example, one, some people call it agile for finance, where they say uh, creating annual budgets makes no sense. That made sense 100 years ago when the environment was still relatively stable, but right now everyone knows that the budgets make no sense after more, uh, anymore after a few months. And then at, at the end of the year, you all know what happens when departments have parts of their budget left, they have to spend it, right? It's a very good time for me as a trainer because I, I make lots of money on courses in December, I can tell you. So many people want, want to get rid of their budget by the end of the year. It's, that makes no sense. So they have different solutions for that, smaller iterations. And The Lean Startup is a very popular book uh, in the last uh, year or so. Basically, they added another feedback cycle to, to, software, uh, to, to uh, agile software development because in the agile world we say, deliver working software. Working software is more important than uh, following a plan and do that in small increments. And the Lean startup community says that's not enough. You have to validate that somebody actually wants to use that software and pay for it. Otherwise you've just created waste. Yes, it might work, but you don't have any users. So find out in the shortest possible time if somebody's willing to pay a bill. Some part of your software must be valuable. That makes sense. Again, shortening feedback cycles. Last example is, is, uh, is design thinking. We could call this uh, agile in the design world. In the 80s already they discovered that they can create the best products when they have cross-functional teams with sociologists and psychologists and, and, and biologists together working on a problem with heavy customer involvement and short cycles, short iterations. Same thing, same ideas that they had, same realizations as in, as in my world. So this, uh, this uh, seems that we're making progress. It, uh, we're making progress. But there's a problem. There's always a problem around this time in any movie, right? There's a big setback. Otherwise, you do not have a good story. So this, here's, the, here's a problem. Barriers to agile adoption. 
according to the same survey, <coughs> the Agile survey of uh, last year, uh, the biggest barrier to Agile adoption is organizational change. The current, the, uh, the, the organizational culture, I'm sorry, the, the, the current culture does not fit the Agile thinking. There's too much command and control usually is, is what people say. It doesn't fit the idea that we have empowered self-organizing teams. And then number three, a general resistance to change. People just don't want to do things in another way. Big issues. Lots of talks in agile conferences are now about organizational transformation and, and change management. So what I think is the problem, and actually I'm not the only one, is we have to develop this kind of thinking in the whole organization about what an organization is. And we have to evolve that from seeing it as a machine to seeing it as a sport to seeing it as a community. That is, that is what needs to be done. Unfortunately, <clears throat> there are people in the organization who have different ideas. There are people who see it as a machine and other people see it as a sport and other people see it as a community and then you get these conflicts and you have this strange not working metaphor of what the organization is. I had a fight with my CFO when I introduced Scrum in the organization. We had four teams and each team needed to have, needed to have its own task board, a whiteboard for sticky notes. So I ordered four whiteboards and the CFO came to me and said, do you really need four whiteboards? Can you not just have one whiteboard and cart it around the teams? And I said, ah, no, no. That was, that was the wrong idea of what it, what it, what it means to, to evolve to Agile. Interestingly enough, usually managers initiate uh, adoptions, Agile adoptions, uh, in 77% uh, of the cases. While what happens, usually the immune system kills it. It, 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 it eats the change, basically. It, it, it annihilates it. That's not what you want, of course. I believe what we can do is, is try to learn from complexity thinking. The word complexity has, has, mentioned, has been mentioned here more often at this conference, I understand. We have to really understand complexity thinking in order to, look, to do better. I find this model very useful. <clears throat> there are three types of systems. Order systems, complex systems, chaotic systems. The order systems are, are constructed. We know exactly how they work, like my watch, my underpants. No difficulty understanding them, right? The chaotic ones, they are unpredictable. No idea what they're going to do. No idea uh, what their behavior will be. The interesting ones for us are the complex ones. They're in the middle, complex systems. Now what is different is the word complicated. Complicated are, 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 are solutions that, that, that take us too much time to understand and don't really work. I totally agree with, with uh, Professor Dr. Garrett. He said, we should make things simple. We should make things simple. I'll give you an example. My CFO had a, a very, very complicated formula for the bonus system. For the bonus system at the end of the year. It involved uh, how many people had worked overtime, uh, their current salaries, their job positions. I'm sure that shoe size was in there somewhere as well. A very complicated Excel spreadsheet. It was not complex because it didn't change according to changing environments. No, it was complicated, just hard to understand. Uh, and in the end, when he started calculating numbers, it turned out some people received a bonus of 10 euros at the end of the year. Wow. It's better to give people zero instead of 10, because there's a, quite an insult, I would, uh, I would say. Some people were very unhappy with that, with that bonus, I can tell you. So um, <clears throat> I heard of bonus systems that are far more simple in, in other companies that work much better. For example, I, at, at, at IGN, uh, uh, American company, they give, they give people points, like 100 points, but you have to give them to other people. So you decide who around you has contributed well to the performance of the organization. And you can use your own interpretation. Like he really helped me with my job, or he baked cookies while we were working overtime, or whatever. So you delegate the decisions to the wisdom of the crowd. And then you can do this anonymously. It doesn't have to be transparent, so you calculate the points anonymously, tally the results, and then you have a, a solution that is simple, but it uses the complexity of the human brain. So that solution is here. We've made it simple, but we moved it to the complex area, understanding that we work with complex systems. So <clears throat> I know uh, 
I've, I've, uh, I've encountered this, this very famous law, the law of requisite variety by William Ross Ashby. Only variety can absorb variety. Lots of discussions about this, uh, about this law. Uh, and uh, uh, this guy, Anthony Stafford Beer, said, uh, Ashby's law of requisite variety is as important to managers as Einstein's law of relativity to physics. Wow, that's, that's quite something. But what does it mean? Well, Nitin Noria, who is the current dean of, of, uh, of Harvard uh, Business School, said, when applied to organization, this, this is the law of requisite complexity. All right, again, but what does it mean? I think this is the, the most useful description I found from uh, Max Boisseau, a complexity researcher who died, unfortunately, last year. He said, the complexity of a system must be adequate to the complexity of the environment that it finds itself in. If the system in an environment is not at least as complex as the environment outside it, the environment will kill it. Something will happen out there that the, that the system is unable to deal with. Ah, that makes sense. But do not confuse this with complicated solutions. As the, the, the example that, that uh, uh, Gerd gave this morning, the pilots had a very simple solution of, of making sure the plane landed. But there had to be some brains involved there in order to apply those simple solutions. That is the complexity that is still there inside of the system of that airplane. The brains applying those solutions. So you cannot reduce the complexity, you have to move it to the right place, which is the human brain. As, uh, as, uh, <coughs> as some would say, it is the most, most complex device that we know of on Earth. So the researchers, the complexity researchers say, use stories. Use metaphors, use pictures, anything that taps into the power of the human brain. Don't come up with complicated rules. They can never be as complex as the world outside. Only the human brain can deal with that. So uh, I was asked to give you some examples of what we do in software development that we might learn from. Here's one example. Requirements. In the past, we made big documents of, uh, of requirements, long pages full of text and, and boxes and, and squares and things like that. We learned that doesn't work that well. It doesn't work. The bigger the document gets, the, more, the more useless it is. What works is pictures, pictures of users. And we say, this is Sally. And Sally wants to use your product for these reasons. And you can imagine Sally. You can understand what kind of user it is. And we present the, the requirements in terms of stories. We actually call them user stories. And then things make much more sense to that complex thing that is in, inside the ears, between the ears of the software developers. So storytelling is, is much better than, than, than documents full of text. <clears throat> Another uh, tip, use diversity of perspectives. People don't agree with each other. And that's a good thing. The science says, actually, the complexity sciences uh, 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 say that, that we should be disagreeing with each other. We should have a bit of conflict. We should not even agree on what complexity science is. Well, that's quite a success already. We, we don't agree. So, point scored there. But uh, this quote, complexity itself is anti-methodology. It is against one size fits all. It's always my, my rex rescue mechanism whenever somebody says, Kanban is always better than Scrum. I say, nonsense. Because the science says it isn't so. You need multiple perspectives. You need some disagreement. How do we implement that in Scrum? Uh, with a simple game, planning poker, for example. We try to estimate how much work is this, uh, is this feature going to cost. Then the whole team is at the table, and they start playing a game. And one says, I think size 3. Another says, I think size, size 13. Another says, I think size 8. And then they compare the results. Why do you think three? Why do you think uh, 13? And then they do it again until the results converge. Again, you tap into the power of the, the wisdom of the crowd uh, there. Different perspectives, different mental models that you try to tap in. Best practice is always past practice, said uh, Dave Snowden, another co complexity researcher. Ooh, I love that quote. <clears throat> what worked for you in the past may not work for you in the future. Actually, it is almost guaranteed not to work for you in the future. So what do we do in software development? After every sprint, we have a retrospective. Are our, the few rules that we have, are they still working? Do we need other rules? And we do it in a colorful way with sticky notes so that people have fun doing it. And then we improve our processes. 
sprint by sprint and change them all the time. So the process is evolving, it is organic. Next example, assume subjectivity and, and uh, co-evolution. What you measure is what you get. And you always have to take that into account, the observer effect. Uh, I had a workshop a couple of months ago in, in the Netherlands where they said, a company said to me uh, that their employees were being evaluated on their happiness once every three months. They had to fill out forms about how they felt, about this, about that, about management, the team, every three months. And I, I, I listened and I asked, so what does this do to you? How do you feel about that? And somebody in the back in the room said, I hate those forms. And then people started nodding their heads. Yeah, I don't like those forms. So I asked, okay, so you have this, this practice that is intended to measure your happiness and it is actually destroying your happiness. Isn't that a stupid thing? Management here is not realizing that the way they observe is actually influencing the system. So uh, what you measure is what you get is, is one version of it. it also may, you also may cause that you're not getting what you measure because you're measuring it. One example is velocity. We have a velocity metrics in Scrum and uh, the Scrum teams know that as soon as management gets wind of our velocity metric, they start asking, can you, go, can you make it go up? Can you go faster? And then the result is they will go faster. Actually, just the metric goes up because the people will start estimating in different ways. They're not actually going faster. They're just, there's just an inflation of measurement, inflation of, of estimation. You have to stand, understand these effects. Then, anticipate, adapt, explore. Three ways for systems to survive in a complex environment. We do a lot of anticipation. I always say uh, anticipation is like alcohol. We, we, we do far too much of it, but we're good at it. Uh, Daniel Dennett, famous philosopher, said the human brain is an anticipation device. This is how we cheat nature. We can actually think ahead, but we can only do that in a small, in a small amount. So, the Agile movement has learned us to rely more on adaptation. Do some, do some iterating. What we sometimes forget is exploring. Just trying for the sake of trying. You don't know what's going to happen. But if you don't run experiments, you will never know. And actually, uh, from information theory, we've learned that we, we, we learn fastest when we cannot predict the outcome of an experiment. When the chance of failure is 50%. So the people who say we should celebrate failure and the people who say we should celebrate success, they're both wrong. We should celebrate half failures and half success because that means we're experimenting and, we, have, and, we, and we, we will learn fastest. So never forget to experiment. In software development we call it sometimes spikes. We, 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 we have simple architectural solutions just to see if, if, they, if they work, if we, can, if we can wire things together. Then develop models in collaboration, the sixth suggestion. That is, uh, uh, the, our, our, we, we have recognized that making big documents full of process descriptions is not working. People in ivory towers giving you a description of how you have to do your work, not working. Because Ralph Stacey, complexity researcher said, those formulating the abstraction, the ivory tower people, they're making a gesture, a suggestion, like maybe you can think of this, maybe you can think of that. But the real process can only make sense in local interaction. I'll give you an example of that. This is a Kanban board. There's, there are two big rules in Kanban. One is limit the work in progress. That is the vertical columns. There should not be more than two or three sticky notes per column. And the second is visualize the, visualize the process. What you see is the process. Not a document in the cupboard, or the closet, or, or anywhere you have it on a desk. That's not the process. The process is what we're looking at. Only that is the process. And if it's not on the board, it's not the process. So that, that is how we make sure that these local interaction, there are people standing there across the board, uh, on the board and they see, they make sense of things. That is how they make sense of, of the abstractions. Almost there. Seventh suggestion, shorten the feedback cycle. You probably have picked that up by now, that this is crucial in agile software development. Eric Ries, also from the Lean Startup, said, the only way to win is learn faster than everyone else. Some say this is, this is how you survive a bear attack. Just run faster than the guy next to you. Right? This is how you survive 
a chase from a bear. You don't have to be a marathon runner, just run faster than the others. So iterate faster. We actually do that in Agile too. Just 10 years ago, the Scrum description said, deliver every four weeks. Nowadays, we consider that slow. We now say, do it every week. And Kanban says, don't do it every week even more. Just do whenever you can, even faster. There are books out there about continuous delivery. Deliver each feature individually at the touch of a button. Facebook does that, and Google, and, and companies like that. So it's going faster all the time. Last tip, steal and tweak. This is what I learned from a new article, uh, uh, from an, an article in New Scientist, where they had complex systems compete with each other, and they found out that the complex systems innovate best when they steal, when they spend 95% stealing each other's practices. They're just copying practices that work for other systems and, 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 and copy them, and then they tweak them a little bit to their own context. That is the highest return on investment. And the last 5% is spent on real innovation. So this is against everyone who has this not invented here syndrome. Oh, what the other guys have invented, that's not working here. Let's invent our own solution. No, oh, that's a big waste of resources. Copy practices from others and tweak them. I sometimes call it the Samsung method. Works very well, I can tell you. So uh, <clears throat> innovate is not just new things, but also recombining old ones. For example, I have this this feedback door that I uh, devised last, last year. It is a feedback wall that already existed. People putting sticky notes on the wall and evaluating a session or a, a, train, a course. And the happiness index, which is from top to down, how happy people are. I combined those two ideas and now it spreads like wildfire. I was at three conferences last month. Every conference they had these feedback doors. So these are the complexity tips that I, uh, that I have all the way from address complexity with complexity to steal and, uh, and tweak. So the message here is you have to use your complexity your organization already has, and it's in, the, in people's brains. That is, that is important. So how can we solve the remaining problems? I'm going to <coughs> quickly flip through these slides because I'm, I'm just sort of out of time. Complexity thinking is what we have to do uh, uh, more, I, uh, I believe. Like asking questions, what exactly is the organization? And is it the bad things that, that organizations uh, go bankrupt? Uh, may, maybe it, this is just a faster cycling through of, of ideas, one organization at a time. Difficult to get used to, but uh, it's an interesting thought. So finding answers, answers to questions is the, is the top level, turquoise. You may be able, not be able to climb this high, but this is about getting healthy, being a healthy organization, adopt, adopt some practices. Management workouts, I call it. Adopt some good practices that other people have, have tried before and then apply them to your own organization. <clears throat> I'll give you one example and then I will stop. Kudo cards that I picked up, an idea in, for a company in Poland. Just have people give compliments to each other. That's a great idea. Incentivize people giving compliments and then the person who gets a compliment gets a reward. Costs almost nothing on, on the corporate budget. But it, the, 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 the CEO who told me this, he said it had an amazing effect on corporate culture. It totally changed culture around, just incentivizing people, giving, uh, giving a compliment. So uh, I, have, I have a compliment for one person. Um, Anya, could you come, come, come here, please? Because Anya is doing a fantastic job uh, inviting speakers and taking care of speakers. I have rarely been at conferences where speakers were so well received. So thank you. This is my compliment for you. You are doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Just give people compliments every, every now and then. And final, final example, then I'll shut up. This is Mr. Zhang, uh, CEO of a big company in China at, uh, at Hire. Uh, 60,000 people, but they have 2,000 people of uh, 2,000 units of small uh, of a small number of people, like like 30 people each, and it's a big ecosystem of, of units that collaborate and compete at the same time. It's like a market within the boundary of, of a big organization. I thought that was amazing. And Mr. Zhang is is stealing management practices from all the people he is able to invite, not just me, but also Gary Hamill and others. I give him great. Uh, Great suggestions, and now they're the biggest manufacturer of, of white goods in the world. So another thing to, uh, to consider. All right, so steal healthy practices, use them in safe environments, 
and, uh, and do this until Melly is really smiling. Thank you very much. Herzlichen Dank. Wir haben sechs, sieben Minuten, vielleicht auch nur fünf, sechs Minuten Zeit für Fragen. Wir können das auf Deutsch oder Englisch machen, ganz wie Sie wollen. Meine erste Frage, my first question yeah. is this. Let's, let's suppose that this model of self-organizing teams is really working well as we believe, uh, at least those who are doing software development. What should the organizational structure in a company be reflecting this? In other words, going from the lowest layer of production to the higher layers. Is that something which already is transparent in some companies, or do you have hints and ideas for that? Yeah. Um, I think one mistake that we have made in the agile world is relying too much on the self-organizing team that is, has become almost dogmatic. You should have teams, people working together as a team, co-located uh, with each other, and have them self-organized. Well, parts of this are, are, are good suggestions, but somebody last, last week uh, uh, had a very good comment. He say, you make the mistake of focusing on the geographical distance of people. So it is not the point to get people in the same room as working, uh, working as a team. What you should focus on is the mental difference between people. So they feel close together, despite no matter where they are. And whether you call them a team or not, who cares? They work together and they share ideas and they're open and transparent with, with their feedback. If you're able to achieve that, then you, you could grow an organization with, with new kinds of structures. Like Hire, has, uh, the company I just mentioned in China, they have 2,000 units of, of 30 people. Some of them, there are multiple HR units and every other unit can, can sign a contract with one of the HR units, uh, deciding which HR unit is doing the best delivering the, the, the right people for the right job. Mm -hmm. If you're not satisfied with this HR unit, okay, next year you sign a contract with the other. But that's experimentation. This works for them at a company in the US, a very famous company, a Morningstar, for example, a tomato, uh, uh, tomato producing company. Uh, they, they have a different, different way of doing things. They have it at the individual level. So they have all the individual people sign contracts with each other. I'm going to collect tomatoes if you are going to turn them into tomato ketchup. And this is, and this is how they grow organically. Management is basically distributed throughout the whole system because management still has to take place, but it is micromanagement by everyone. They're all managing each other, actually almost as freelancers, with one brand, one, uh, uh, one set of, of products. So there's no universal solution. But if you have the, the, the right constraints in place, a short mental distance, I would believe people sharing ideas and ready to experiment, then you can evolve your own organizational structure around it and try to get rid of too many management layers. Ihre Fragen. Ja, no problem. Question here. Um, uh, you you uh, you are building software that uh, has has uh, small parts, has short term uh, aims, and you need an overall architecture. Mm -hmm. You need a big picture yes. in mind, and we all know that the big picture to keep that in mind is not easy in, in a Scrum group where you yep. have your short sprints. Yes, the short sprints might be very useful and successful, yep. but you have the good chance that you lose the big picture of your overall architecture. So yep. how, how do you solve that problem, that you need people who keep in mind um, the overall solution? Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, you still need people who consider architecture. I'm totally, I'm, 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 I'm totally agreeing with that. Uh, like, for example, you cannot start writing the first line of code without considering what is the program language going to be. Well, that is an architectural decision. <laughs> Which language? Will it be Java or .NET or, or anything else? So some people have to think of, of, of decisions. The problem is, we are, most of us have been making decisions too soon. 
There's a movement uh, within the agile world called Real Options. Uh, they, they steal ideas from the financial world where they keep uh, teaching us defer decisions until the last responsible moment. Because often we make them too soon, even architectural decisions. And still, if you made a decision, can you make it in such a way that later you will be able to turn things back and go in another direction? That allows you to experiment a little. So we are being taught to defer decisions, not to make them too late, of course. So there is, there is a balance. And I would say this is intuition at work, perhaps a, a, a professional experience that people will simply have to build up over time. Unfortunately, that experience is lacking uh, with many teams. And so we do see the problem that once organizations go from traditional uh, upfront planning to scrum teams, they lose sight of the architecture because the experience of understanding when is the right decision to make is not there and then they make it too late. So basically they swing to the other side, right? And the, the, the art is yeah, making the right solution. Exactly, exactly. So we cannot solve them with a method or rule, but you can solve it by developing the brains that we have on the teams. All right. Great question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much again, Jochen Appello. And we will continue our discussion later. <laughs> <laughs>